So, all right. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to one of the two invited talks uh, today. Uh, I am Bo Guo uh, from the University of Arizona, and I will be the moderator of this session. Um, our invited speaker is Professor uh, Masha Perdanovich uh, from UT Austin, uh, and she will talk about database, uh, pre uh, database uh, prediction of uh, transporting hydrogenous uh, force media. Um, so, uh, Professor Masha Perdanovich is an uh, uh, associate professor and uh, uh, chef from uh, Centennial uh, uh, Teaching Fellow in uh, the Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. So, she's an applied mathematician. Um, and uh, she received her PhD in computational uh, uh, applied mathematics and statistics from uh, State University of New York uh, at Stony Brook. So uh, Masha is known uh, for her pioneering work uh, in direct simulation of flow and transport in force media and, and integrated um, with uh, you know, advanced high resolution imaging of, of rock microstructures. Um, in addition to research, uh, Masha has, um, you know, act organized and instructed internationally uh, multiple short courses on image analysis in Porsche Media, and is very passionate about uh, creating open source community and data environment in digital rock petrophysics. I'm sure many of us in the audience have probably used the digital rock portal for um, uploading and sharing, um, you know, image uh, data sets, um, and uh, for which uh, Masha was was the founder. So uh, Masha's work has also been uh, widely recognized uh, by various uh, communities, evidenced by the long list of awards, including the recent ones from SPE, uh, from Texas University and uh, uh, Stony Brook, and in particular um, uh, from Interpol, uh, the Proctor uh, Gamble Award uh, for Prosimia Research in 2014. Uh, Masha also uh, is very active in uh, multiple scientific societies and holds leadership positions um, in NSF EarthCube uh, Leadership Council, Interpol Council, and Siam uh, Program Director. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to the talk uh, today. And without overdue, let's welcome our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Masha Perdanovich. So Masha, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody hears me really well. Uh, let me share my screen. So just for a little bit of fun uh, to introduce University of Texas and their uh, Longhorn Bevo <laughs> behind me. Uh, this is uh, in Austin, we are known as Longhorns <laughs> and that's because of this mascot. Um, it's actually, if you drive around Austin, you can uh, see these um, mighty bovines uh, all over uh, the place on ranches. So this is just for a little bit of fun. And if I sit precisely in the correct position, then it looks like I have some long corns here. So without further ado, <laughs> uh, thank you for being in my talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about data-based prediction of transport in forest media. And as uh, Bo kindly introduced me already, uh, I'm pretty passionate about combining data and simulation and speeding up both of those. So I'm gonna rather briefly present some attempts to automate or speed up the prediction of transport in forest media. So our objective is to in general, whatever it is that you're doing in porous media or subsurface, you would like to predict on some larger uh, scale. And uh, that larger scale though, uh, re does require knowledge of how does small scale influence uh, transport. So we would like to, for instance, predict uh, a flow on field scale, which is typically modeled by a Darcy's law or some variety of it. But for that, you need permeability. And so you would need some geometry properties, which is here uh, formed by permeability, and some fluid properties, which is here represented by viscosity, to actually see how it goes on larger scale. And how you need to find out what permeability of different types of porous materials that you might have in this field is in order to do that. Now that, that's what you do on a large scale. Uh, the way small scale comes into this picture is that this permeability is highly controlled by the features on micron scale. So you have to transcend a lot of scales in that process. And we often, what Bo referred to as direct simulation, we often use direct simulation to actually come up with both the float field and then integrate it to get the permeability. 
Okay? Now, you can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we have mentioned simulations. So this is the result of a direct simulation where you basically get the flow field, all of the details, gory details of it, if you will, on a very small scale. So you can see that this is only a few millimeters across. And then you integrate it to get the flux and ultimately you compare to Darcy's law to get the permeability. You can also do a lot of uh, uh, lab scale uh, 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 lab scale experiments, and then you are going to basically fit the uh, data that you get into some sort of a functional relationship, permeability versus porosity, for instance. And there are also theoretical uh, derivations. I'm sure everybody is familiar with cosenic Harmon prediction based on porosity and the grain size for granular materials. Now you still have some. Uh, fitting here to do uh, because uh, not everything is always known. And the promise of a, what we call digital rock physics or direct simulation um, is to basically image the sample, get those de details of geometry, then create a model uh, and use it in simulation. Which type of simulation I'm going to be showing one type of simulation in this presentation. That's not necessarily the point. There is a variety of simulation methods out there. Some are some like network models are faster than the others, like um, direct simulation. But either way, you are getting this flow parameter that you need on larger scale. And maybe you're interested in flow, so you're going to get permeability or relative permeability, capillary pressure and saturation relationships in multi-phase uh, flow simulations, or you might be interested in uh, electrical properties, formation factor, or mechanical properties such as Young modulus. Either way, the process is the same. You image, you prepare a model, you use it in simulation, and you get uh, these parameters that you need on large scale. However, if you specifically use direct simulation, that can take orders of hours and days on high performance computing uh, resources. Now, if you have a heterogeneity, heterogeneity in your medium, that throws in a wrench. So here's an example, is a, this is a natural chalk. And again, this is over a relatively small scale, but you will have a fracture here, some bugs. They're actually in three dimensions. This is a three dimensional rendering right through this bug here. Uh, that is, uh, uh, co they're connected together. And there's also microporosity that I'm actually not showing here in this 3D model. So combining all of the scales is a challenge. Now this heterogeneity will cause this permeability porosity relationship to essentially break down. So you don't, you have a cloud, you don't have a functional relationship and you need to go through rock typing and figure out, figure out what are the classes of rocks for which you can actually form this relationship. So the process is pretty involved. Now, what we wanna do here is we want to automate predictions. So given, let's say that I do have a variety of images and I do a digital rocks portal that was already mentioned that, that I will uh, pinpoint later a little more about, has a lot of these images about thanks to the advances in imagery. So let's say that you have a segmented, which is binarized poor solid image any image, so as, heterogeneity, as heterogeneous as it wants to be, can I provide a fast and accurate fluid flow prediction? I'm focusing on fluid flow, it could be some other transport. Okay? And we want to leverage computer vision, convolutional neural network developments. I'm gonna briefly introduce all of those. And uh, optimized hardware such as GPUs that most likely even you have in your laptops these days, as well as open source uh, tools that have been developed to actually use that hardware and uh, widely shared. And that's what we want to harvest. Uh, those advancements are what we want to harvest here. So I will very briefly uh, review what I've referred to as generation one for flow networks. Uh, this was actually the subject of the talk last year uh, in Interpor. There's also a recorded uh, webinar uh, most recently in the paper and code from 2020, as well as the data are available. So what did we find out in this first generation of uh, neural networks that allowed us uh, to predict permeability? First, I will just briefly sum up terminology. Maybe you've heard about neural networks, maybe you have not. The basic idea is, let's say that I'm trying to predict uh, whether I have oil and water based on the input of density and viscosity. Then I'm going to 
pass that information, which in this case is just two, two numbers, through a bunch, a layer of so-called neurons, which are going to process this data in some way that comes from different, all of the inputs is, are going to be processed, combined, and then I'm gonna get a prediction. Now, this is one layer. Typical network out there has multiple layers, and then we call it deep because it has multiple layers. And really what I'm optimizing this process, I'm typically giving it a fixed structure of this network. That's a hyperparameter. But what I'm optimizing is all types of baits that are going in and multiplying inputs and combining them in these neurons using activation functions to give me prediction. And I do multiple passes with the data I have. Let's say that I have a labeled problem. Um, I will uh, use a part of those labeled problems to train this network and optimize the parameters on the way. And then I'm going to uh, be able to then give it any other input parameters and give a prediction based on this uh, training if the training went well. So this is really going uh, in a high, uh, high level <laughs> explanation with a lot of hand -bait. Okay. Now, what do we need for images? Images have spatial structure. So we need something called convolutional, uh, convolutional neural networks or CNNs that take into account that spatial structure. So you basically summarize over 2D or 3D uh, neighborhood of a pixel or a voxel, you summarize it using a convolution, which is a, a functional combination of these uh, voxels, and you process the image. And in the process, you're gonna uh, downscale or reduce the size of this image. And that's uh, what you use instead of these functions because your inputs are not just single numbers, they're actually spatial structures or images of numbers. And this is something that has created a lot of, of advancements in a lot of processing of images. However, these things work fast if I'm using 2D images for which they were actually originally created, 3D poses problems. So. In this uh, paper from last year, what we attempted to do is to use a single binary image and train the network to give a prediction of a velocity field in 3D. So it's another image uh, that comes in as a prediction that we can integrate then and get permeability. Now, what we found is that just giving it this image fails. You need to, in addition to this image, give it a number of other features, what's called features as input. And those features really were selected based on the knowledge we already had in digital rock physics and characterization of a porous materials. So without maximum, was, a, a lot of you have probably heard about maximum inscribed square, spheres or Euclidean distances so forth that are uh, processed types of these binary images and their functions of these binary images, and that they describe the structure, connectivity, and tortuosity of uh, this pore space. So my resulting velocity field is really this neural net function of all of the features that I give it as input. Well. Okay. Now, we were, had a good success in relatively homogeneous materials. So we trained this on sphere packs and some cemented, slightly cemented or consolidated sphere packs. And we, are, we were able to predict sandstone permeability really well. And in that process, we cut down the time that you normally use for lattice Boltzmann, for instance, or any other direct simulation. Again, the method itself does not matter that much, but it's going to likely take hours on a parallel computer. And the tighter the porous medium, the more difficult the porous medium, the longer the simulation takes. Whereas CNN will give you a prediction in minutes. Now, the main bottleneck for CNN is that the training uses very small subset of the input image because it cannot uh, let's say that the typical uh, uh, digital rocks portal image has 500 cube or 1,000 cube. These days you easily get 2,000 cube, but you can't give that right now to a CNN. Now, specifically, if you have, so let's say that this is your input image, basically this relative size of this uh, uh, box here is what you can process using CNNs. So you're going to take your input and chop it up in sizes of these small boxes. And then you're going to train with that in order to 
uh, to train your CNN and get the prediction using neural nets. Now, if you have a feature such as a fracture that is percolating across your image, it is not captured with this type of a size input at all. And that's the main problem of why these networks are failing when you give it uh, an image uh, such as this, where you have the fracture going across. Another problem is that this is precisely where your permeability porosity relationship fails because you, depending on how you orient this fracture this way, this way, or at 45 degrees here, you're gonna have three different permeabilities for exactly the same porosity. So this directionality is what you're hoping image to capture. So CNN should as well. So what do we do? We move to what I call generation two or so-called MS nets. This is fresh of the virtual press two days ago. So you can, uh, it's an open access um, uh, paper in transport in porous media. We attempted to overcome this limitation uh, of this small, in our case, it was 80 cube on a standard uh, GPU of 24 gigabytes of memory. Uh, so basically on that order is what traditional CNNs can process in 3D. Now, how do we overcome that? The basic thing is to consider multiple images at the same time. I'm showing this in 2D, but let's say that I have a fine scale image, which is 256. It's really cubed, but I'm just showing a two-dimensional slice of it. We will pool it or coarsen it n times. And for our examples that we have tested so far, we did that four times, okay? So I will have four different scales of this image. And on a coarsen scale, you, you, you see this main fracture coming through. This is actually what I'm looking, uh, what you're looking at here is a distance field, but you don't see all of the details in the matrix. However, we're gonna give the network this image at the same time, all of these scales. That requires a trick because you can't necessarily, image-wise, you cannot compare easily 32 cube into 56 cube. Those are different dimensions. So to order to overcome that, we're using a mask that ba basically pulls this image at the same time, but it, it can always unwrap the features on the size that we need. What do we do? We take, so let's say that this is my fine scale image. And for example, it has 0, 0, 0010. If I coarsen it with a simple two by two convolution, I'm gonna get, well, an average 2.5 using one type of uh, filter. Yeah. Now, I will also recall a mask, which is 0, 0400, 0, 0, that I can multiply this pointwise to actually recover the fine scale image. So at the same time, we are remembering this mask. So even though I have an average solution that uh, enables me to go smaller in size, I can uh, always recover a fine scale based, uh, based on a finer solution. So this is hiding a lot of details. Each of these convolutional neural networks is actually um, a neural network with its full complexity that I'm actually not showing with all of its deep layers that I'm not showing on purpose. Okay. Um, so, but at the same time, we're using these multiple coarsenings. Again, in our work, we're using four and adding all of those things at the same time. And that way my view is wider and I can see multiple scales at the same time. So I do need to have, again, this masking for refinement as well as coarsening operation at the same time uh, put together. Okay. Now, my solution is then this masked combination of multiple scales. So if this is my true or fine scale solution, these are, this is the, these are the solutions that I see on different scales for, in our case, that I'm combining into my prediction. So the advantage of the previous work is that I don't need these features that took us a moment to actually tailor and find what works. So I don't need 
uh, maximum inscribed spheres as one of the features or Euclid uh, or uh, or different types of tortuosity and connectivity and time of flight from one side of the image to the other, which still was not enough due to the finite CNN size to actually capture heterogeneities. The model is able to see with wider eyes and spot these heterogeneities because it has the information, information from multiple scales at the same time. So basically, my velocity field prediction is this sort of nested networks from multiple scales, again, we used four instead of, but it could be n, uh, based on the input structure. Okay. Now, we initially trained this on a variety of synthetic images. Uh, so basically, there's some examples here. So there's a matrix here that has certain grain size, and then I have propant or a model propant in a fracture in the middle. So I have two, two variety of sizes. We also have a fractured sphere pack. There was also a wide variation of these that we literally played with to create uh, artificial samples. We also initially when we worked with the first training set, and you can see the details in the paper, if I just trained my network just with these, the predictions were good for a good variety of sandstones uh, and images of carbon that's harvested from uh, digital rocks portal. However, uh, they did not do well on single fractures. So we then provided additional training with a fractured data set. And then when I, whether I sample a fractured example from, um, from the, uh, the digital rocks portal or non-fractured ones, I actually have a good uh, relationship between predicted uh, and true permeability. So we do capture a heterogeneity again with the limitation right now of uh, on images that are posted on the portal. We can also, uh, I don't have this on the slide, but it's available in the paper right now with the 40 gigabyte, uh, uh, 40 gigabyte, uh, memory GPU and NVIDIA's uh, video card, we can actually process images of the side on the size on the order of 800 cube, uh, 832 if I uh, remember correctly. So that's a pretty good size for CNN, compare that to that 80 cube. Huh? So can, can I now push this further? Can I also get heterogeneity in complex fluids? And just to pique your interest as uh, well, here's a, complex fluid, particulate fluid. Uh, this is fluid uh, laden with propant entering a fracture. This fracture is also from Digital Rocks portal. And you can see uh, how this propant uh, accumulates near the contact areas. You're looking at the top, uh, sort of a top view of this fracture. So can I capture something like that? Well, I'm gonna say that that's a near future task. So right now we have focused on a single phase flow multi-phase flow or multiple other um, possibilities such as heterogeneity of vetability or having a complex full fluid or multiple fluids that is coming up and we're working on that. Uh, but that also requires having data sets to train these. And I'm gonna remind you that this relatively small image uh, of a complex fluid in its full uh, glory, took 48 processors and running for about 100 hours on, um, on a computing cluster, uh, Lone Star 5 in TAC. Okay? So this is something that is of a challenge, having data that you can use to train these images. This is why I also want to motivate you to post your data and tools. Uh, Digital Rocks Portal is one uh, place that is suitable for images or re results of simulation. There is also Open Porous Media Initiative, and uh, you, where you can also link the codes and data, uh, both codes and data. So this data curation and simulation connection is key to a future automation where I will be able to show up on Digital Rocks portal and sort of click on a button and get either uh, send this to uh, uh, to 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 tack to simulate um, uh, simulate and get the result back to Digital Rocks portal um, uh, in a number of hours or actually click and get this fast prediction. So either way we need quality benchmarks um, and they're not so easy to share. So I do want to motivate you to share them.
Um, so with that, I want to thank you. Uh, here's my email if you want to contact me and ask any more questions. I think I'm right on time to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, follow Digital Rocks portal, post the data there. You can also follow our newsletters and, and we do organize uh, visualization contests and mini courses uh, typically once a year. Uh, and I thank the Digi Digital Rock Physics and Direct Industry Programs at TT Austin for funding. All right. So thank you, Masha, for being really, you know, sharp on time. And uh, I we tried. have <laughs> I really tried. Um, for, for questions. And, um, you know, this is really interesting talk that gave us some hope of speeding up, um, you know, poor scale simulations that have, has always been a headache, you know, in computational cost. And um, so, I would like to immediately comment that this is not just a poor scale problem. It's a really problem on any scale. So similar, uh, similar steps uh, need, could be followed on large scale as well. You just need detailed, uh, for this approach, you need details of geometry. That's a, that's a very good comment. Yeah. yeah. So in, in the, we have a few minutes for questions. So I already see a few of you uh, raised, uh, rose, uh, raised your hand. So I'm going to unmute you. And, uh, and so the uh, first is uh, Yashar. Yashar, um, you, you should hear? be able to talk. I don't hear anything. Is there Hello, a chat? Sure. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll go to the next one and see if it's a technical problem. Um, I unmuted uh, Oleg. Yes. Oleg, are you able okay. to speak? All right. Yes, I speak. All right. Great talk, Masha. I have short questions. Uh, first of all, if you go to unresolved porosity and consider Brinkman, do you think that uh, the chances are the same? And maybe more important, how many samples you will need to evaluate with your network to compensate the time which you used in the training? Right. So right now, what we pose uh, as a problem is the we are trusting lattice Boltzmann simulation in the geometry that we had. So if I had Lattice Boltzmann that incorporates Brinkman, and there are such efforts that I used to train with, then this, this approach should recover. But that's not, okay. we did not Thank include you. microporosity in this training. So assuming that you have the data to train with, it should work. And assuming that 800 cube <laughs> detail, level of detail, right now with the current GPUs is enough to capture uh, enough of an REV, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so thanks, Oleg. Uh, Ashar, um, I think you are allowed to talk, but I think you are muted. Uh, or some, there's some you? issues. Yes, I, all right. I, <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. I was Yay, technology. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a fascinating talk, Masha, and it's great seeing you. Uh, but I have a two-part question. Uh, I also have to leave a, a little bit uh, later for a different session. But uh, my first question is, how reliable is the velocity field that you get from this? Is it divergence-free? And can you, for example, do um, prior transport simulations on it? And the second part is, um, can, you, um, can, you can you account for different boundary conditions? Yes, again, you can account for different boundary conditions if your uh, whatever truth simulation you're giving to the training I can, right? right? So I need to be able to train with multiple. Now, we haven't buried boundary conditions in this process, so that would be the next step. We kind of kept, kept it on the same sort of scale and the same type of conditions. Now, the second question, uh, or the first question, rather, is um, can you can you remind me what was the yeah how reliable the velocity field is? So the velocity field, and I invite you to actually look into the paper the differences. Um, when you integrate it, you get a good result up to up to five percent different from the original for permeability. 
velocity field will have local variations. And one challenge of these uh, networks is that you don't know why you got a difference in certain location. And right now, our current guess is that essentially our training does not have all of the details. We break up images that we have, or we have the features, geometrical features that we do capture in our images. And beyond that, if the network now sees something that is too different from it locally, it's gonna have variations in the velocity field that are different. So it's not divergence free and necessarily, be, and we don't require it to be. We just give it a divergence free input, but then there will be some, uh, some differences from divergence free. Right. So it's awesome. not, it's not the, the network itself does not require divergence free. That would be kind of an, an additional request to your. Oh, that's still cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masha. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Ashar. So we have uh, time maybe for a very quick question, the last question. So uh, Jun, Jun Xia, uh, could you, uh, you're, you're allowed to talk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have a, a simple question. Could you please briefly introduce how you speed up your simulation using GPU for your convolutional yeah, these are, these network are GPUs. models for the, for the heterogeneous case? So essential, uh, so the the net once you do the training on your using your cnns then the the prediction is sped up to a minute yeah. so uh, you you cut down your simulation time multiple <laughs> hundred times essentially depending on an image but it's this training part that requires some yeah. time and lots of, lots of different input. Right now, we created about four or five data sets ourselves, and then we used about uh, two more from the Digital Rocks portal for training. And then we use Digital Rock portal, other examples that are independent for validation. But so the more the merrier, essentially. And it's this training that takes a moment. But once you train, then presumably you get the prediction that is. OK, thank you. So awesome. during the training, you don't use VP. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's current ch challenge of any type of neural network approaches is that the training can take quite a while. And you yeah. need these yeah. labeled images. So we needed to have a lot of simulation hours done in order to train, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Once you integrate all of that, then you get the prediction. So, and that's the challenge right now because you need quality training in order to get quality prediction. Thank you. Which so, is why so all right. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you again, uh, uh, Dream, for the question. And uh, so, you know, it, it really, uh, let's uh, thank um, our speaker, uh, Professor Masha Pranovich, uh, again, for this amazing talk that, you know, potentially can be generated also to not only port scale, but also, you know, reservoir scale simulations. And different um, types of transport. Exactly. So, so you know, it's really a fascinating uh, work that can lead to multiple directions in the future. And uh, thank you everyone for attending um, this invited talk today. And with that, um, I will see you around at the conference. All right. Thank you. Bye.